Hello, the former leader of Essex County Council has appeared in court accused of expenses fraud, but he's told us he's done nothing wrong. Lord Hanningfield appeared before magistrates today. He's accused of claiming money to stay overnight in London when records allegedly show he was driven to his home in Essex. His defence team say he'll claim parliamentary privilege. Our political correspondent Andrew Sinclair was in court. He joins us now. Andrew. Susie, until just over a month ago, this was Lord Hanningfield's power base, Essex County Council. From here, he dominated the county's politics for many years and spearheaded many radical, often controversial, policy initiatives. But now that's being done by the people because he's had to stand down as leader while he fights these allegations. And today, under his original name of Paul White, he made the first of many court appearances. His day started as normal at his home in the village of Hanningfield, an early morning walk with the dog. Except this morning, he also had to face the press. I have done nothing dishonest ever. I've given 40 years of voluntary service unpaid to this community, to Essex and public. Saved them millions of pounds. I've done nothing dishonest and I'm sure it's all going to work out fine for me in the end. He's accused of returning here at night but claiming for an overnight stay in London. Under expenses rules, he was allowed to claim between £154 and £174 a night if he stayed away from home. Seven hours later, Lord Hanningfield was arriving at Westminster Magistrates Court. Dozens of photographers were waiting outside. So too, a handful of protesters. In the dock of court number one, he sat on his own, listening to proceedings. He clearly answered not guilty, as all six charges of false accounting were put to him. The whole hearing lasted just eight minutes. He left surrounded by photographers and to jeers from protesters. The police were eventually able to help him into a taxi. Lord Hanningfield isn't used to this sort of treatment, but his case is going to remain in the public spotlight for some time to come. Now, the case will go before a judge at Crown Court in three weeks' time, and there we expect Lord Hanningfield to claim parliamentary privilege. He will say, in effect, that because he's a parliamentarian, he should be answerable only to Parliament, not the courts, for his actions. Now, this is something that's never been argued before. I can see this going to the High Court, to the Supreme Court, before any trial takes place. So this affair will go on for some time, well into the rest of this year, probably into next year as well. Andrew, thank you very much. One of our biggest hospitals is seeing a new rise in cases of norovirus, the bug which causes diarrhoea and vomiting. As a precaution, Addenbrooke's Hospital in Cambridge is limiting visitors to all wards. And Look East has discovered that nearly half of the 18 hospital trusts in this region have closed wards because of the bug. The details now from Alex Dunlop. Well, Stuart, have a look at this. This is how the norovirus looks under a microscope, really rather benign, but I can tell you it packs quite a punch. I've just stressed this is not a major outbreak, but this is the time of year, winter, when all our hospitals are in particularly high alert. Even suspicions of the bug can lead to ward closures. Now we've learned that around 13 are currently closed at eight major hospitals. Most have uh, just one ward closed, the James Paget and Galston has closed two, but the worst affected are Adam Brooks in Cambridge and the Queen Elizabeth in Kings Lynn. Each has three wards closed. Broomfield Hospital in Chelmsford is closed to visitors for the third week in a row to stop the spread of the norovirus. Visiting times at Adam Brooks Hospital in Cambridge have been cut after an outbreak of norovirus the winter... Highly contagious and widely feared. At the Queen Elizabeth Hospital in Kings Lynn, three wards are closed to new patients, but all wards are closed to visitors. Georgina and Kenneth Griffith's son was on one of the affected wards this week. It meant they couldn't visit him. They say the hospital has poor hygiene and poor communication. If they made public aware of the issues in the hospital, instead of keeping it a secret society, the public could actually help and aid the hospital if, there is, if the problem is cleanliness. An independent inspection of the Queen Elizabeth in December highlighted shortcomings. The trust, it said, breached the regulation to protect patients, workers and others from the risk of acquiring a healthcare-associated infection. Hi, Liz. This is the norovirus. This is where the hospital tests for norovirus. It says it acted immediately on the report's recommendations. 45 patients have tested positive for the virus within the last three weeks. We've got quite an elderly community. Families work very closely together, so it spreads around families, children, grandparents. 
they then get admitted to the hospital and that clearly affects the amount of patients coming in with the virus or with relatives coming in with the virus that are visiting. Now, norovirus is really pretty horrible. It causes sickness and diarrhea and it can be pretty serious for the very young or the elderly. It usually lasts between 12 hours and 3 days and it's extremely contagious as I say, especially easily passed on in places like schools, offices and hospitals. Now, 15 months ago in January last year, the Health Protection Agency set up an internet database where trusts could go online and enter real-time information on outbreaks in their hospitals. But Look East has learned that only these 11 hospitals feed that information into the reporting scheme. Have a look at these. These ones have not opted in and some say they don't intend to. So exactly how useful is the scheme? It's very useful. It's an epidemiological tool used nationally to track outbreaks to see what norovirus is doing across the country. It's becoming increasingly useful as more and more trusts join in. So I think in a few years' time, I'm hoping that all of the trusts will have joined in. Well, we'll see how that rolls up. The good news is that spring is just around the corner, but the advice is if you have symptoms of norovirus, norovirus, don't go to your hospital or local surgery. You could spread the infection. Instead, call your GP or ring NHS Direct on 0845 4647. Stuart. Alex, thank you very much. Well, still to come in, look east, the sound of the stars. We'll find out the news from schools across the region and the old name back on the Formula One grid. Yes, it's a grand old name in motorsports. Senna and Mansell have all raced for... A man who murdered a woman in Suffolk in front of her children has had his prison sentence increased. John McFarlane was originally given life for killing Mary Griffiths in Bury St Edmunds. He was told he'd serve at least 20 years. But today the Court of Appeal increased that to 30 years. This was Mary Griffith's family at the Old Bailey last year. Her killer had just been sentenced, but for them, justice clearly hadn't been done. We stand here with heavy hearts, praying that John McFarlane will never be able to walk the streets again. However, the punishment which was bestowed upon him today was not harsh or severe enough. Today, three appeal court judges agreed, saying the original sentence hadn't reflected the aggravating features. John McFarlane, they said, had been guilty of what was a deliberate execution. He'd been besotted with Mary Griffiths and killed her with a bolt gun used to stun animals. She'd been at home in Bury with her three children when he smashed his way in. They said the judges would be permanently scarred by the memory. It was a very significant increase. Um, but the reason we um, sought the referral to the Attorney General was that we felt the original sentence was unduly lenient. I think today's sentence reflects that. In a statement this afternoon, the family said, we feel strongly that justice was not fully served last November. Our objective was for John McFarlane's sentence to be reflective of the heinous crime he forced on our sister Mary and the nightmare her three children have had to endure as a result of his evil actions. Mary Griffiths had called police hours before she died. She was worried about McFarlane. An investigation into how that call was handled is still underway. Kevin Birch, BBC Look East, in Suffolk. The singer Pete Dunn.